Uh, hi everyone, it's time to start. Uh, my name is Ilya Kosmodemyansky. I'm working for the Data Agrid. And today I will present you the talk about PostgreSQL worst practices. Uh, I think it's a good talk after lunch because, yeah, you know, uh, you'll recognize some practices, maybe mm, make some fun about that. Uh, it should be not so boring like usually it can be. Uh, so, uh, why worst practices? Most of all because best practices are just very, very boring. Uh, never <laughs> follow best practices. Uh, you can read those books and you know, just stupid things in those, thing, uh, in those books. Um, because worst practices can really help you to screw the things up. And you can repeat that w one time, two times, and every time the result will be the best. Uh, besides of that, uh, we who help you with Postgres are nice people. Try to make us happy. Uh, we will be happy and, yeah, and thankful. So, how it works. Uh, actually, uh, I do not make this up. So, it's everything I uh, experience in my life as a support engineer, as a consultant working with databases. Uh, I just uh, have lots of examples. Uh, to be honest, uh, more than a uh, more than a hundred now, and, and counting, I am just adding things uh, while working with Postgres. Uh, then, right before the talk, uh, actually in between the lunch and this talk today, uh, I run the script and it shuffles uh, everything uh, and prepares for me a talk for around 20 worst practices. Uh, to be completely honest, uh, there are some worst practices I like a lot. So I just uh, hint them and pin them into the representation. Uh, please forgive me uh, that at least I honestly uh, say that I do that. So uh, let's uh, see an example how it works. Uh, the example is very simple. Do not use indexes. That's a good example of worst practice, a testing one. Basically, uh, full scan, table scan, index scan, for God's sake, why those indexes were invented actually? It's a really stupid thing. Uh, you can just insert turn rows on your uh, non-production environment on your laptop, see that uh, actually my thesis was correct. Full scan and index scan basically the same. Most likely you will need to hint your optimizer to uh, do the index scan in that case, but uh, who cares? Optimizer is a stupid thing as well. Um, so, nobody deals with more than 10 rows in production besides of that. Just do that. The first one. Use as many count store or count one if you are smart. Uh, as many as you can. Because uh, highly concurrent environment, uh, you have thousands of uh, application connections uh, simultaneously. Um, that's okay. Uh, after each refreshing of the internet site, for example, your user will see some very meaningful figure and it will change after next refreshment. So just do that uh, because, uh, you know, it's a fast query. PostgreSQL will never check the version of exact row to count. Uh, it just do that uh, flawlessly and without any problem. So uh, actually you can cheat. You can use best practice. You can estimate the amount of the rows from a PG catalog. But never do that because uh, lots of counts, you call for some PostgreSQL consultancy and uh, people can improve behavior of your application within several seconds. Uh, you can save on consultancy in that way actually. Um, another one, use object relation mapping. All databases basically share the same syntax. You know that already, probably. Uh, you must write database independent code because most likely you are moving from one database technology to another one twice a day or uh, maybe even more. I don't know. Um, and there are no any benefits on speci database specific syntaxes uh, because, you know, SQL standard is pretty the same. Uh, inside all the databases are pretty the same, so do not use it in any way. Uh, and besides of that, uh, all modern ORMs are quite complicated new technologies for you because 
for example, take a look on Hibernate. Uh, people developed that for more than 10 years. It is really complicated. You can improve your skills. Use ORM. Move your joints to your application. Uh, just select everything from each table, put into your application, uh, use your favorite programming language, just think, okay, my favorite programming language is Python or Perl. Uh, I should do that inside the application. Then join them at the application level. And that's it, practically it's very convenient. You use your favorite programming language. Now you only need to implement few things. One of those things is algorithms for joins, nested loop, merge join, so on. And then you need to implement an optimizer to choose the proper join algorithm. That saves you a lot of time and it, it's fun anyway. So, so do, the, do that. Uh, and many people do, actually. It's, it's I would say it's not quite worse practice because so many people do that. It's practically a best practice. <laughs> Be in trend, be schemaless, because this boring schema from back from 70s, that, that's an annoying thing. Uh, you just not need to design a schema. You only need one table. Actually, to, to be honest, who never did that? Yeah. <laughs> I can guess that. Uh, JSONB data type is pretty effective in Postgres. So basically, you can search this uh, quasi table uh, just as a normal table. And you can put max, 100 max in the JSON type, um, put thousands of parallel TPS, and that's it, that's working. JSON is very effective. Uh, that we call that very universal approach, yes? So, um, basically for each and every application you can have basically the same schema. Um, but, you know, uh, at some point, people try to figure out what, what can be better. Uh, and actually, I have another worst practice which can help in such cases. Uh, be agile, be universal, use entity attribute value. Maybe you need to improve the previous schema using uh, only three tables, entity, attribute, and value. Uh, that's very common in enterprise and regulated industry, for example. Um, at some point, you need to add uh, the fourth attribute type because you figure out that okay, there are some vouchers, ints, uh, something like that. Not all attributes are equal. Um, that's very universal. You basically don't need to change your model and application to, to work with that. But at some point, it starts slowing down. At that point, you should do a very important thing. You should call this thing kernel, or core, or main system, or something like that. And then add more than 1,000 denormalization tables to make it finally work somehow. Um, but that's not the end of the story, because after all those necessary steps are done, usually people try to add some, some, something more complicated, like value version. Because, you know, um, it's much easier to add a version than to delete something from this Agile schema, uh, at least to delete that fast. So be Agile, use entity attribute value. It's the best solution to achieve the high performance database application. Try to create as many indexes as you can. You know, some of my worst practices are controversial. Yeah, so I, um, indexes can assume no disk space. It's true, yeah, you know. Indexes do not consume any shared memory. Indexes do not have any types of overhead. Just add 100 indexes to one table and uh, put on PG Bench something like uh, Alter Column or something like that and see the results. Uh, you will know that I'm telling you completely true. Optimizer will definitely choose your index. Uh, there are actually some um, controversial practices like uh, you can query PG catalog and see how many uh, times your indexes was actually used. But that's not the topic of this talk. Uh, so I do not uh, advise you to do that. Uh, just keep calm and create more indexes. 
All of this keep your old time series data. If you write in something like inventory type, uh, log analyzing, something like that, all those data should be in your database forever. Because you know, it's common uh, business requirement. We want analytics on everything. That's, that's very typical thing. Uh, basically, uh, your data aggregates uh, will never change. And you can put all those historical data to some archive database in case we really change uh, once upon 10 years or something like that. But never do that because you will have some benefits. You will always knew where to dig if you run out of the disk space because it's easy way to run out of disk space. And you know, uh, there is one, another benefit and very strong benefit you always can call that big data. <laughs> Everyone enjoys big data. Uh, it's not smart today to have small data. You know, or you go into the conference on low available websites uh, with talk about small data. <laughs> you probably will be never accepted. Uh, actually, to get things even worse, uh, you can uh, solve those with PostgreSQL partitioning uh, technology. So just, uh, you need to choose uh, how to partition smart. Uh, one second for a partition, that's a good choice. So <laughs> you will have thousands of partitions uh, a day and optimizer will be happy and your DBA will be happy, everyone will be happy. And besides that, um, you know, uh, there is no easy big data. Big data should be, hard to achieve so and hard, hard to handle. Uh, otherwise, it is not a big data, so do that. Turn auto ACU off. <laughs> you see, uh, I, I knew more than one way to achieve big data. <laughs> it's quite easy to have uh, several gigs of meaningful uh, data in your table, and the size of this table can be easily uh, one terabyte or something like that. Depends on how fast you run into wrap around. Uh, but do that. Uh, just uh, switch off to vacuum off. That's a really stupid auxiliary process. Um, and it's actually a very annoying process because it runs for days uh, and interrupts, interrupts uh, many things in database. Just switch it off. Uh, I don't know why by default it's uh, on now. For years it was off by default. Uh, for years there were no auto vacuum at all. Um, just do that. Reinvent Slony. Who knows what Slony is? Uh, who likes to maintain Slony? I knew one man here probably can say that. But uh, you know, uh, PostgreSQL has uh, replication in core uh, now for quite nice amount of years since version nine it actually in core. Uh, since version 9.1, it's usable. Um, okay, uh, you need to reinvent Slony. Write your own script in Python, which takes uh, logs from one machine, puts to another, and uh, controls to apply. Uh, use one trigger based, write your own, for God's sake. Um, because it will allow you to run into all the problems Postgres had since introduction of Slony. Replication. Uh, uh, should not be easy. Replication should be very complicated. So do your own and that will be good. Keep master and slave on the different hardware. Because you know, um, this stupid idea of that you need master and slave just to make a proper failover fast, um, you can keep that in very different ways because uh, if you have different hardware, uh, you save on hardware your uh, slave machine is much less expensive, for example. It has no such amount of memory, uh, cheaper disks and so on. Uh, that's really good uh, reduction of the costs. Uh, and when you file over, uh, everyone will understand that our DBA team is very important. Everyone will remember your phone number. <laughs> uh, always try to achieve more than one goal at once. Um, uh, to make things even worse, uh, you can actually leave the config parameters on the slave untouched. Then you fail over back. Uh, you will also 
became a hero of your uh, company because everyone again will remember your phone number. Put the synchronous replica to remote data center. Uh, all these people explain that the, we do the, those things for maximized high availability. Indeed, uh, if you have synchronous replica in different data centers, if something happens, not only with master, but with a slave, uh, all your clusters don't. So basically, that's a good idea. Uh, but uh, as always, I have a good recipe how to improve things. Uh, just put that to another continent. Synchronous slept replica overseas will always work like expected. Just do that. Don't ask me why. <laughs> Never use foreign keys. Uh, use local produce instead. Um, consistency control at application level um, works every time as expected, especially in our era of microservices. Uh, you will never ever get data inconsistent using a uh, constraint check uh, in the code. And another argument is that a database like Postgres truly ace it uh, more than 20 years in production uh, that is a bulletproof uh, way to maintain consistency. It's a good argument not to use that for that purpose, at least. So never use foreign keys. Always use text type for all columns. Um, it's always nice to implement using regular expressions or something like that, validation for IP or for date or timestamp or something like that. And actually, uh, it allows you to find out uh, what happens in your database, like uh, digging through the logs, uh, uh, trying to figure out who uh, did, uh, from which application we uh, got dates like these. Uh, I can guess that that one was from the Pro application, yeah. Um, but Actually, there are lots of ways how to screw the things uh, if uh, you're not using proper data types. Um, always use an improvement, improved fork of Postgres or make your own. Because you know, Postgres, it's not a perfect database uh, and you're smart enough to make it uh, smarter than uh, all those uh, stupid people who write the code. All these annoying KVCC behavior uh, 32 bytes transaction ID in 21st century, uh, all these stupid, stupid constraints, um, auto vacuum, rebalancing, or something like that. Uh, that's only because uh, community is stupid. Uh, hackers are old uh, and quite lazy. They just don't want to change things. So hack it in hard way. Um, do not bother to submit any of your changes to the community and maintain it by yourself. Um, and actually, it will be easy to merge that uh, afterwards uh, into the main tree if you want, because uh, you only will need to uh, change. You know, Jim says we had about uh, 2,000 uh, lines of code changed every day, so you maintain probably your fork uh, for half a year or a year, you can easily calculate how many m lines you need to merge after, after that. Uh, so for some of Postgres code works, uh, that takes forever. So, you know, there are several folks based on uh, eighth version of Postgres still trying to, uh, to be merged in the mainstream. So use always an improved Postgres. Uh, it's a good idea. Uh, Postgres, like every uh, multi-version concurrent control database, like long transactions. So it's a quite good idea not just only use long transactions, but for example, call external service uh, from a transaction like sending email or interacting uh, by web service or with some uh, vendor or something like this. Uh, you probably can say, okay, you are kidding. It's really good practice because we need transactionally send emails, uh, exchange information with uh, GMS uh, queue or something like that. Uh, I probably agree, but this with a small comment. It's arguable. If the most of developers will be familiar with the word timeout, 
Uh, most likely it works uh, quite otherwise. Uh, you can just start transaction, go away for weekend, and wait for wraparound. Uh, and yeah, besides of that, it uh, gives you a clue, okay, we need to improve 32-bit uh, transactions, okay. Never read your code you just uh, wrote. I just uh, put it here. So uh, you write the code, <coughs> never read it again. You can never do the stupid thing writing a code. Even worse idea is uh, to test it after that. So it, it basically, it's, it's not ORM generated code. It's re a real human did that. So uh, just never read your code more than once. Have a problem of your PostgreSQL installation? I have a good recipe for you. Move those problems to the container. Because you know, it's, uh, you'll be in trend actually. Because it's always good to put something very persistent and very stable in something very unpersistent and very unstable. It definitely will solve lots of problems. Besides of that, you know, every worst practice has some uh, additional benefits, I would say. Like, uh, now your problems are both outside and inside. Uh, outside the container and inside the container. Besides that, you probably will learn how to automate your deployment and so on. And uh, you can learn that very good because uh, for putting databases into containers, uh, you need lots of skills in automation, most likely. Uh, not only Slony can be reinvented. Need to convert to temp, write a storage procedure in C with a case which checks uh, the timestamp and converts it to Unix time. Uh, you probably uh, think I'm kidding. I saw that uh, in production more than once. So people, uh, for, for, for many people, it's much faster to uh, implement something than to read the documentation. Uh, that's a typical situation. Uh, but not, lo not only for timestamps. Need a message queue? Write it. Postgres has lots of things which can shoot your leg in that direction quite effectively. For example, select for update, no wait. Yes, it's possible to make a uh, message queue based on table using that. And most likely it will work. How many time you spend to achieve that? Uh, or advisor works, or something like that. Uh, and besides that, you need to tune out a vacuum carefully on that table, and so on. But just do it. Want to use ORM, you probably figure out that ORM is a bad idea, because I mentioned that in worst practice slide as a second slide. Write your own using storage procedures. Just generate uh, SQL using storage procedures. Optimizer and parser will be happy, and it will be very easy to figure out where is the problem. Just do that. Don't want to use ORM, write your own. And never, never, ever use exceptions. Because, you know, documentation says they are slow. There is some box in documentation that says that. It's really strange. Uh, as DBA, I usually think that developers do not read the documentation. But for some reason, this stupid block in PostgreSQL documentation, everyone read that. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> uh, maybe because uh, rice not ice on error, it's a good idea because, you know, everyone constantly will take it and pay attention to the logs. Uh, the error will be never lost in those logs. Uh, and anyway, who cares about uh, errors? That's uh, actually some annoying thing. Uh, and uh, you will never try to expose that to the customers and so on. So just, uh, just don't use that. Application runs out of connections. That's on one of my favorites, actually. Uh, just set max connections to 1,000 to 10,000 or whatever you can guess. Uh, you know, um, one of reasons for that is that today the hardware is cheap uh, and servers with 1,000 CPUs are quite not very expensive. Uh, and, you know, Postgres will work effectively on the eight core machine with 1,000 connections, of course. Uh, and besides that, uh, that doesn't solve your problem of your application, then it tries to uh, 
connect too many times, not closing transactions, and so on and so on. That's really um, some annoying thing. You don't need to dig inside of that. Um, and who said the PostgreSQL workers have some overhead on proof of work, on CMOF wars, and so on? Uh, that, that's rubbish. And never ever use PG Balancer uh, because it will be our best practice probably. Instead of PG Balancer, you should use PG Pool. Pooling connections with uh, PG Pool is quite easy. Uh, who ever tried that? And who used PG Balancer? And who used 1000 connections? <laughs> uh, <laughs> nobody usually say that. Uh, pulling connections with PGPool is easy. It's almost like writing a code in the Emacs operating system. Uh, so uh, I knew that people could do that and enjoy that, but uh, most likely I'm, I'm a VI person. Um, simple config, uh, really easy, no documentation needed, uh, useful features. So basically, uh, it's good to have built-in replication and connection pooling and out of a library which uh, you cannot use manually. Uh, so you know, there is a beautiful creature, a duck. Uh, a duck can fly, swim, and run. And probably in comparison to some more uh, specific species, uh, all three things duck performs badly. Uh, that, that's a case of PG pool from my point of view. But I should, no, n but I should never say that because, you know, uh, consultants will be happy. Uh, I really pleased when people use PG pool instead of uh, PG Balancer because, you know, you, you always can charge uh, something more about that. All this starts tuning Postgres from, for example, optimizer options in Postgres call conf. I saw that many times that uh, Postgres misconfigured badly and people try to uh, figure out uh, a big red bottom or silver bullet to tune the things and um, forget almost about the shared buffers, the stupid checkpoint stuff, uh, amount of connections and so on. Uh, you just uh, need to start with something really helpful. Uh, G genetic query optimizer is a good candidate to be a silver bullet. If you change a couple of those parameters, everything will be good. Uh, just forget about the short buffers and checkpoints. Uh, try to change something in configuration which looks complicated and helps a lot. Uh, at least you can spend lots of hours doing that. Um, and probably the last uh, bad practice for today. Uh, have you heard about the new cool feature? Immediately use that in production. Uh, as a, uh, it only can be better if you uh, try to skip the testing and staging and so on. Just put it in production. Don't know how to do that? Uh, I teach you. Uh, <laughs> right today, you can do that in a couple of hours. But rush, it's... Uh, Everything should be very fast. Uh, go today to MVCC Unmasked by Bruce Momjan. Today, uh, 3.50 uh, p.m., Liberty One. Listen and learn. Learn about Xmin and Xmax. Right? Go to Bruce and ask, what's Xmin and Xmax designed for? And after that, don't listen to his answer. That, <laughs> That, that's an important moment. Uh, use it in your application logic immediately. You know, this stupid transactions ID, uh, maybe you remember I said they are uh, 32 bits. Uh, so if you have a lot of transactions, uh, they just uh, keep in rolling, 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 rolling. If you use that for some version control inside your application, once upon a time you will never run into the new number of transaction and uh, nothing will be bad. So just it's a good checklist how you can uh, use a new cool feature immediately. Then I first listened to Bruce talk about that. Uh, it was back in 2011. I said, okay, so I should wait for that uh, from my customers. It took two weeks or something like that time. I got the first question about how to use that in practice. Um, but anyway, 
Don't forget that was worst practice talk. Because I knew the people who just took a photo of my slides, put that on Twitter, <laughs> and then GD spills his coffee because uh, he decided that it was best practice. Uh, don't forget to send me your favorite if you want. I will try to include that. And feel free to take uh, the talk and present there somewhere in user group or something like that. I definitely knew people from uh, PG Day France will uh, license it that and add some very specific French bad practices uh, and will present that uh, at PG Day France. So feel free to do the same. And uh, if you have some questions or suggestions, we have plenty of time to do that. <laughs> Thank you.